Mr. Chairman, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, I can safely and proudly say, Ebenezer, thus far the Lord has brought us. It appears only yesterday when by the encouragement of my wife, Afia, the annual Berea Lecture Series was instituted. So soon, today's lecture is the ninth in the series. On behalf of the ever diligent planning committee, I wish to once again welcome all of you to this year's lecture. As usual, this also promises to be engaging like the previous eight. This is what Bereans, such as those in Acts chapter 17, are noted for. They search the scriptures and make them the only support for their beliefs and practices, even if they are unpopular and depart from what is generally accepted. I wish to thank all those whose financial support made the ninth burial lecture possible, especially uh, Dr. and Dr. Mrs. Alote, Brother Kweku Bwedu, Brother Kwesi AJ, Brother Kweku Akagbo, the CEO of Naira Group Com Company Limited. I wish to also acknowledge the immense assistance I obtained from the interpretive eschatological hermeneutic of the following scholars, Gary DeMar, Dr. Kenneth Gentry, Jr., Dr. J. Stuart Russell, Dr. R.C. Sproul, Dr. Bruce Gore, Hank Hanegraff, Eric Holmberg, and Professor N.T. Wright. This interpretive eschatological approach takes into account the historical, grammatical, and cultural context of end time prophecies, especially what they meant to their original audience. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, who is the Antichrist? What is the mark of the beast? When did Christ say he would return? Predictions regarding the return of Christ and his attendant issues are perhaps the most abused biblical prophecies in Christian theologizing. This began in the first century at the time of the apostles when it was rumored in Thessalonica that the coming of the Lord had already taken place. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Since then, the slightest shaking in the world leads prophecy watchers to see in the happenings signs of the return of Christ and the end of the world and predict dates which have all failed. The more recent and most popular attempts at predicting the date for the return of Christ began with William Miller, a Baptist end-time preacher and founder of the Millerite movement. His study of Daniel chapter 8 led him to predict that Christ would return in 1843. When the prophecy failed and Christ did not return in 1843, Miller predicted October 22, 1844 to be the correct date. Many American Christians from almost all denominations sold their possessions in expectation of Christ's return 
but were disappointed and devastated when he did not return on that date. The event came to be called the Great Disappointment. Between 1850 and 1856, Ellen G. White, a co-founder and prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, made many predictions concerning the coming of Jesus, all of which failed. She was part of the remnant that came out of the Millerite movement after the Great Disappointment. Another failed pre prediction of the date for the end time return of Christ was by Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He predicted that 1891 will be the date for the return of the Lord, by which time he will be 85 years. Incidentally, Joseph Smith died in 1844 at the age of 39. The Jehovah's Witnesses are perhaps the, most, the worst culprits when it comes to failed predictions regarding the date for the second coming of Christ. Some of the days they have predicted for the return of Jesus are 1914, 1915, 1918, 1920, 1942, 1975, 1994, none of which proved to be accurate. Edgar Weisnert, a Christian layman who wrote the book titled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. Millions of believers bought that paperback, but that also turned out to be a false alarm. We also remember the 1999 Y2K computer back scare of the coming end of the world, which also passed quietly. The impending 1999 Y2K program problem and technology itself was seen as a tool that will allow the Antichrist to seize power. The world and time smoothly passed from 1999 to 2000 without any of the computer hitches and the chaos that had been predicted. Pastor Harold Camping, an American radio preacher, predicted that Judgment Day would strike the earth on May 21st, 2011, at precisely 6 p.m. in each time zone across the globe. This also turned out to be a hoax to the shock of his handful of followers. In Ghana, the founder of Makara Church, Prophet Anamu's prediction of 11th November 20, 2011 as the end of the world also failed to materialize. Recently, he was on Net2 TV making a lot of noise after making failed predictions of the coming of Jesus Christ. An American end time children's pastor, John Sorry, claimed in 2011 that God had enabled him to decode a passage in the book of Revelation. That allows, that shows that the rapture will be between 2011 and 2020. John Shorey uh, wrote a book, The Window of the Lost Return, 2011 to 2020. Are we the tribulation generation? In it, he lays out startling revelations that show that people in 2011 were experiencing the bad punks of a historic window of events prophesied in the Bible. Another American, Kenton Beshaw, also claimed that he had resolved the problem regarding the date that Hal Lindsay got wrong, and that the correct date for the return of Jesus is 2011 or 2021. Hal Lindsay predicted the return of Jesus in 1988, 40 years after the rebirth of the state of Israel in 1948. This happened to be a false prediction because Jesus did not return in 1988. Beshaw thought that if Lindsay had used 70 or 80 years for a generation instead of 40 years, the rapture would be either 2011 or 2021. The world is waiting to see whether Beshaw's name will miss the long list of false prophets who have misfired in their prediction of the return of the Lord Jesus to the world. Tim Lahey who together with Jerry Jenkins are behind the popular 16 series Left Behind series 
believed that the return of the Lord and the rapture of the saints will occur in his lifetime. Incidentally, he died in 2016 without witnessing the rapture. I guess you have also recently heard Pastor Chris Oyakilomi of Love World Ministries predicting that the rapture will take place in less than 10 years from now. There is also a Canadian, a French Canadian Roman Catholic priest who is also claiming that this past October was to be the beginning of the end of the world and that he went to heaven and met Mary and met um, Jesus' father Joseph and met Angel Michael and Angel Gabriel and met the baby Jesus also in heaven. And they, Mary appointed him as the end time apostle and so he is warning the whole world that the world was so, supposed to have started ending in October, like, uh, October which is past. Why are they misfiring? The story is told of a little boy who lost his coin and was frantically looking for it with tears. An older person sympathetically volunteered to assist him to look for his coin. After searching futilely for some time, he felt prompted to ask the little boy to show him once again exactly where the coin dropped. The little boy pointed to a location quite distant from where they were searching for the coin. When asked why he was looking for the coin at the wrong location, the little boy replied that it was because the place where the, the coin dropped was dark. It is no wonder that they could not find the coin. The coin dropped here. The boy was looking for the coin here. The man asked him why. He said because the place is dark. The list of failed predictions regarding the second coming of Christ will be unending due to the disregard of the time indicators in Christ's conversations with the Jews in the gospel concerning his coming. A careful study of the time text in Jesus' conversation with the Jews regarding his coming and the time frame references in the writings of the apostles will stop the misfiring and land us and lead us to the certainty of when Christ said he would come. The purpose of this lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to demonstrate that end time prophecy watchers misfire because of their failure to take into consideration Jesus' time frame references in his conversations in the Gospels regarding his coming, and that if they do, they will understand when he predicted to come. They will know the identity of the so-called Antichrist and will not see 666 as a number with an evil magical power. Now, who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist seems to be an elusive character. In history, several persons and organizations have been seen as the Antichrist. They include the papacy, that is, the office, of the, the office or authority of the Pope, especially Pope Leo X. He was a Pope during the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther. Martin Luther claimed that he was the Antichrist. Incidentally, he also said Martin Luther was the Antichrist. Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte was an anti-Catholic French emperor of conquest. He was, at his time, described as the Antichrist. Adolf Hitler. He was the German Nazi leader who made a covenant with Satan and massacred many Jews. He was also described as the Antichrist. Benito Mussolini. He was a, a former president and a fascist leader of Italy. In fact, when some missionaries went to him and told him about the Antichrist, he was happy to be the one. <laughs> then 
uh, John F. Kennedy, who was a former president of America, was also described as the Antichrist. And the reason is that he received 666 votes at the 1956 Democratic Convention, and he later died of a head wound, and therefore he was described as the Antichrist. Then Ronald, Re Ronald Reagan, who was also a former president of America, was also described as the Antichrist during his days. And the reason is because his name and his address, his Ro Roland is six letters, Wilson is six letters, Regan is six letters, his address is 666 Cloud Road, so he was described as the Antichrist. <laughs> Then Mikhail Gorbachev, who was also a former president of the Soviet Union, and the reason why he was described as Antichrist, you see his forehead, you see there is a, some, some mark on the forehead. They say it resembles six in the, in the Hebrew uh, characters. In the Hebrew character, this is six, and that is on his forehead, so he is the Antichrist. Then Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger is a former uh, U.S. Secretary of State, and he was involved in uh, peace making in the Middle East between the Jews and the Palestinians. His name in Hebrew adds up to 111, which is 666 divided by 6. So he was also described as the Antichrist. Then Barack Obama. Barack Obama was the first black president of America. One of my students used to argue with me that he was the Antichrist. At the time, Barack Obama was the president. And I asked him, why? Then he said, see, his guy is called the beast. <laughs> but this car is just the car of every American president. It, it is not only Barack Obama's car. Every Amer even Trump also sits in this car. It is called the beast. Maybe because of how robust it is. Then Jared Kushner, he is the son-in-law of President Trump, uh, Trump, and he is also described as the Antichrist because his address is 666 Fifth Avenue, New York. Then Bill Gates, because Bill Gates, uh, who is uh, uh, because his Microsoft company is believed to be teaming up with big pharmaceutical companies to combine vaccines and a microchip to produce a digital ID, which is ID 2020 for a new world order. Therefore, he is described as the Antichrist. Then Alexa, Echo Dot. This is Alexa, this is a machine. They say the machine too is an Antichrist. Because it, it is an electronic device with some intelligence produced and sold by Amazon. This machine can think. If you ask this machine, who is the president of Ghana right now, he will tell you it's Nana Kufuado. <laughs> so a machine with intelligence is also described as the Antichrist. So who is the Antichrist at all? The word Antichrist is a biblical word. And it is found in only uh, three books of the Bible. Written by one person. That is 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 22. You'll find the word Antichrist there. Then 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, you find Antichrist. Then 2 John 7, you'll find Antichrist. And so let's all read it together if, if you don't mind. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. This, was, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 uh, to 23. Let's go on. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. Let's go. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you, you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, 
which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Second John 7. Let's go. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. These are the only passages in the Bible that, that mention Antichrist. Now from these passages, we learn that the ant Antichrist were many. They were not political. They were just religious. They lived in the first century, in John's days. They are not yet going to come. They lived in the first century in the days of the one who wrote this epistle called John. They denied that Jesus was the Christ. They denied the Father and the Son. They denied that Jesus came into flesh. They thought that his supposed fleshly body was only an illusion. They became apostates and they left the mainstream Christianity. This is what the Bible describes as the Antichrist. That the Bible Antichrist is therefore not a future political politician who will rule the world by technology with the power of Satan. But a heretical Christian group that disagreed with mainstream Christianity on the nature of Christ, whether he was divine and whether he came into flesh or not. As far as the Bible is concerned, these are the Antichrist. They lived in the days of John. Now, the beast of the book of Revelation. What many people call the Antichrist is actually the beast of Revelation. Or the man of lawlessness of 2 Thessalonians. It is important to recount few things concerning the book of Revelations. Even though this lecture is not about the book of Revelations, since we are looking for the beast in the book of Revelations, it is important for us to say a little about the book of Revelations. Incidentally, John, who wrote the epistles that talked about the Antichrist, is the same person who wrote the book of Revelations, but he never mentioned Antichrist in the book of Revelations. He rather calls somebody a beast. And Paul, in 2 Thessalonians, is calling someone the man of lawlessness. They never refer to these people as beasts, as antichrists. Number one, the book does not refer to anyone as antichrist. The book of Revelation, you will not find antichrist in the book of Revelation. Two, the book was written to seven churches in existence in Asia Minor, that is Turkey, in the first century. These are the churches. You see them, Pegamon, Theatira, Sadis. Smyrna, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea. And this is Patmos, where John was imprisoned by a certain Roman emperor who had imprisoned him in Patmos. And in Patmos, Jesus appeared to him and asked him to write the letters to all these seven churches. These are churches which existed at the time in the first century. And so the letters were written to them. And in these letters, a beast is being described. Number three, the book was about current issues written in coded apocalyptic language or Old Testament language. It was not about 21st century. It was about things happening in the first century that Jesus asked him to write to the seven churches about things which were happening at that time. For two times in the book, the audience was advised to apply their wisdom to understand the symbols. Two times. The first one, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. So it was possible at that time for them to know who was the beast because they, had, they were supposed to apply wisdom to calculate and know who. It is the name of a man. And they were supposed to have wisdom to calculate to know who. He was referring to as the beast at that time. The second one, 
Revelation 17, 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So two times they are asked to use their, their minds to understand the symbols in the book of Revelations. And point five. The events were to take place shortly, soon, or speedily. Everything in the book of Revelations was written from Patmos to the seven churches. And the events talked about are going to happen very quickly or very soon. In the first century, they were not to wait to happen in the 21st century. There were things that were to happen soon. And so it was a warning to the people to be on their guard because the things in the book, which are written in symbols, which they could use their wisdom to calculate to find, are going to happen soon. Revelations 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. 2. Revelations 1.3, blessed are those who read and hear it, for the time is near. Revelations 2.16, repent, otherwise I will come soon and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 3.11, I am coming soon. Revelation 22.6, he sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Revelation 22.7, behold, I am coming soon. Revelation 22.10, John was not to seal the words of the prophecy because the time was near. Revelation 22.10, behold, I am coming soon. Point six, the book was a revelation or an unveiling of Jesus as the Lion of Judah who will soon bring his wrath on those who reject him and persecute his saints. So it was, there was an, a, an aim and a purpose for the writing of the book of Revelations in which a beast is mentioned. And it is written to the saints who are being harassed by this beast. And he says that Jesus will, will reveal himself. And he will come to attack that beast who is destroying his church and rejecting him. So this is the image that is seen in the book of Revelations of Jesus who is unveiled. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not a revelation of the Antichrist. The book was not written to show us who the Antichrist is. It was written to show us who Jesus is as a judge who will soon bring judgment upon those who, are, who have rejected him and are harassing his saints. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He appeared like the son of man, standing among seven golden lampstands. He was dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, he had a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool and snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze growing in the furnace, glowing in the furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. He held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. So this is the purpose of the book of Revelation, to reveal Jesus who is coming as a judge against those who reject him and those who are harassing the saints. And the beast is the leader of those who are harassing the saints in the first century, not in the 21st century. Seven. The events written about in the book are the judgments to soon come on Israel and Rome, resulting in the destruction of Jerusalem, its people, and its temple, and the eventual disintegration of the Roman Empire. So these two cities representing those who are harassing, who have rejected Jesus and are harassing the saints. Jerusalem representing the Jews who have rejected Jesus and are, and are killing Stephen, killing James, and killing all the Christians. And then Rome is supporting them to do that. So the judge is being revealed as a lion coming soon against 
Jerusalem and against, the, against Rome. And he is coming to destroy Jerusalem. He is coming to destroy the temple. He's coming to kill the people in Jerusalem. And then he's going to cause the disintegration of the Roman Empire in the first century. Now, the identity of the beast of Revelation. The beast is most likely a contemporary of John in the first century. He was there. He was alive at the time John was writing the book of Revelation. So he was referring to him. But he didn't want to mention his name. Because this same person had thrown him into prison in Patmos. So when he was writing the letter about him to the churches, he wrote, he wrote it in coded language. So that a Roman soldier will not seize it from the courier who is sending it from Patmos to the churches and say, hey, you are insulting the emperor, eh? You will put you deeper into the dungeon. So he wrote the letter in coded language. But he knew that the people had wisdom to calculate and to understand who he was referring to as the beast. So the beast was alive at the time John was writing the book of Revelations. The term beast in the book of Revelation is used to refer to both a kingdom, Revelation 13, 1, and also an individual. The beast stands for a kingdom in the dream of Daniel. So in Daniel, a beast is also mentioned, and it represents a kingdom. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. So in the beast in Revelation, one of, one of the beasts is a kingdom, and one is an individual who is the emperor of that kingdom. As a kingdom, the beast comes from the sea. He has seven heads and ten horns. Seven crowns for each of the seven heads. So this is what Daniel saw, uh, John saw in the vision. He saw a beast coming from the sea with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. On the, on, on the head. The seven heads of the beast are seven hills on which a woman sits, and there are also seven kings. This is likely to be Rome, which was called at that time the city on seven hills. It also had seven, it also had ten provinces. The seven heads were seven of her kings, seven of her emperors. The, beast, the four beasts in Daniel's dream were the four kingdoms of the image in Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar also had a dream, and Daniel also had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream correspond with Daniel's dreams, and they all represent kingdoms. So you can see Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the image. Daniel's dream is the animals. So the head corresponds to the animal, the first one. And the chest and the arms correspond to the second animal. They are all kingdoms. The, the, the waist down, they correspond to the third animal. And then the feet down correspond to the last animal. So God showed it to Nebuchadnezzar and showed it to Daniel. And has shown it to Reve John in the book of Revelation. And they are all talking about the same thing. They are all talking about events that are going to happen in the first century in Jerusalem. About those who are rejected Jesus, and are killing the saints. As an individual, so this one represents four kingdoms. So the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, and the Romans. The same applies to the animals. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greeks, and the Romans. The Romans was the animal that, that John hadn't seen before. Very strong. As an individual, the beast represented one of the seven heads or the emperors of the beast from the sea. Uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 to 11. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, one is the other has not yet come. So, uh, as an individual, uh, uh, the beast represents the emperor, one of the kings of Rome, of the Roman Empire at the time. This is likely the emperor 
in Rome at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. Now, how do we identify the beast? The beast who is also a king. He comes from a kingdom. We know the kingdom is the Roman Empire. Now, the beast is a king. And now, how, how do we identify him? The writer of the book gave us two clues by which to identify this beast who is the king and the emperor at the time. Clue number one, the number of his name. The number of his name adds up to 666. It is not 666. It's 666. They are, they are not the same. 666 and 666 are not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we know him revelation let's read it together revelation 13 18 this calls for wisdom if anyone has insight let him calculate the number of the beast for it is man's number his number is 666 666 is there 666 is therefore not a plastic, the plastic card of the cashless society concept that many people are thinking is the Antichrist. It's not this. It's, this is not the 666. It is not the implantation of microchips or biochips under the skin or eye for identification and control. It is not when they put something under your skin or put something in, in, in your eyes to identify you. That is not it. That is not, it is the number of a certain man's name. It is not the universal use of barcodes for identification. It is not a vaccine against COVID-19 or any other disease. I am so surprised that COVID-19 vaccine has become the Antichrist. Already Ghana, there are so many vaccines that are given to children. Uh, Pastor Tamakro is a pharmacist, he will tell you. How many? Six? Six or even eight? Some of them are combined against diseases which are given to children who are born in Ghana every day. They are not the Antichrist. The COVID-19 vaccine comes and it is the Antichrist. It is not a vaccine. It is the number of the name of a man which can be calculated. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. In English, names have no numbers. Letters have no num uh, uh, numbers have no uh, 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 letters. To correspond to them. English alphabets do not correspond to the Arabic numerals. For example, A is not one, B is not two, and C is not three. However, in Latin, seven letters are used to, in combination to express numbers. So I is one, V is five, X is ten, L is fifty, C is hundred, D is five hundred, and M is thousand. This is in Latin. In, therefore, 1776 is calculated in Latin as M D C C L X X B I. So if you write this, it's the same as 1776 in Latin. Now, the Greek and Hebrew letters also have numerical values like the Latin or Roman numerals. The Roman emperor at the time was Nero and must have been the person referred to by the book. The name Nero Caesar. Emperor of the Roman Empire between 54 AD and 68 AD adds up to 666. Nero's name in Greek, when transliterated into Hebrew, is Neron Kaiser, written in Hebrew letters anglicized as N R W N, but that's is not this is not English, it's anglicized. Now, and the numerical value of Neron Kaiser is 666. Noon is 50, Vav is 6, Kof is 100, Resh is 200, Resh is 200, Nun, Nun is 50, Samek is 60. If you add it all, it's 666. That is the name of Nero 
Caesar, the emperor at the time John was writing the book of Revelations, if you add up the letters that make up his name in Hebrew, that is what it comes to. But so many names can come up to this. How do we know it is Nero Caesar? Number one, he was a beast at the time. He was the emperor at the time. But a certain, uh, a certain manuscript was found which had the number 616. Six one six, not six six six. But when you write it in Latin, from Latin to Hebrew, this is from Greek to Hebrew. That is that is six six six. But if you write it from Latin to Hebrew, it comes to six one six. That is Nero Caesar, and that is why he is the probable candidate of the beast at the time. Even though many other names can come up to 66, they don't come to 616, which is another manuscript that was found telling the number of the name of the beast, which means the person who was, who was copying was somebody who, who was a, a Roman or somebody who wrote in Latin. And so when he discovered 6, he realized, no, Nero Caesar in Latin is not 666, 616, so he corrected it. And he became six one six. That is why it is Nero who is the probable candidate for the beast in the book of Revelations. Now, clue number two. The term of the king, he was the sixth king. Five have come and gone ahead of him. Let's read. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is one is. The other is not yet come. So he's the fifth king. Now, if you look at the empress of, of Rome, Nero was the fifth. Julius Caesar was the first. Augustus Caesar was the second. Tiberius Caesar was the third. Gaius. Caesar, Caligula was the fourth. Claudius was the fifth. Claudius Caesar was the fifth, and Nero was the sixth. Nero was the son of Claudius, an adopted son of Claudius Caesar. So he was the sixth. So by the time of the emperor too, we know, by the number of his name too, we know. So he is the probable candidate for the beast of the book of Revelation. And he was also the emperor at the time John was writing. And he was the one. Let's look at other qualifications that make him the probable candidate for the book of Revelations. The Roman persecution of Christians began under him after he blamed them for the fire that burned a part of Rome. Nero was the one who began the persecution of the church. He wanted to develop a part of Rome like Agboboloshi. He intentionally went to set fire to Agboboloshi to burn it so that he can redevelop the place. And when he realized that the Romans were not happy with that, then he blamed the Christians for being setting the fire. And then he came and arrested the Christians and burned them, burned them on stakes. He started the persecution against Christians. The persecution lasted for 42 months, which is in the book of Revelations. Three and a half years, 1,260 days, from November 64 AD to June 68 AD. He executed Peter and Paul. He is the one who killed Peter and Paul. The deification of Roman emperors, which began under Caligula, came to a head under him. He, he called himself God, and he wanted to be worshipped. The one who started it is Caligula. But then he was the next to continue the deification of the Roman emperors. He poisoned his half-brother, Britannicus, who was the real heir to the throne. Claudius' son was Britannicus, and he knew that Claudius could become the next king. And his mother was Agrippina, married to Claudius. And therefore he poisoned uh, Britannicus so that he could become the next emperor. And he 
Britannicus died and he became the next emperor. This is how bad he was. He castrated a boy and married him as a wife. Homosexual rape was his pastime. He executed his own mother, who engineered for, her to be, for him to become the emperor. He executed his own mother. You know how he did it. He asked soldiers to take her on a trip on, a, on, 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 a, on the ocean. And losing some of the bulls of the ship so that she would drown and die. His own mother, who engineered for him to become the emperor. But when the boat was drowning, the woman was so tough and so strong that she was able to swim. And then he had instructed the soldiers that when she does not die through drowning, they should stab her to death. And they did. He executed his own wife, Octavia. He kicked his pregnant wife, Popia, to death. He had some two advisors. He, he became an emperor at the age of 17. And therefore, there were some two older advisors that his mother appointed to guide him to be the emperor. When he grew old and he, became, he killed them. The Jewish revolt and wars resulting in the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple was during his reign. This is how Roman historians of the first century describe Nero. Pliny the Elder, he described him as a destroyer of the human race. He the poison of the world. Juvenal, this is how he described Nero, a cruel and bloody tyrant. Tacitus, a Roman historian, this is how he described Nero, the most cruel torturer of Christians. Apollonius, this is how he described Nero. The beast. He claimed he was an actor and he staged programs in the theaters. And when he is acting, you cannot even go out to urinate. All pregnant women are forced to sit down for six hours until he's done before you go, you can go home. Even if you want to go to the toilet, do it in the theater. It is very likely that the character John called the beast is the same that Paul calls the man of lawlessness or the man of sin. So John is describing him in the book of Revelations. And Paul is describing him, Thessalonians, as the man of lawlessness, the man of sin. Concerning the coming, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read it together. I, I see some people sleeping. Please don't sleep. Let's read it together. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. Okay, so that is about Paul also describing this probably same person as the man of lawlessness in his letter to the Thessalonians. At this time, Paul was also alive. John was alive. Peter was alive. But in the end, Nero killed Paul and he killed Peter in Rome. Now, so the, the, the person that people call Antichrist, the Bible doesn't call him Antichrist. The Bible calls him either the beast or the man of lawlessness. The Antichrist were a group of Christians who had theological issues with the mainstream church. And then they defected and they left the church and they went to another part of the world. They were the Nestorians and, and the others who had problems with who Jesus was. The, the church was saying he was divine. They said he wasn't divine. The church said he came into flesh. They said no, he came in spirit. The church said he, he and the father are the same. They said no. And so they had issues. The mainstream church called them Antichrist. But the man we call, or people call Antichrist, who is expected to come, is the beast. 
But even this beast lived in the days of John and Paul. It is not now that he is going to come. Nobody should be afraid of any Antichrist coming. He has come already. He is dead and gone. Now, the coming of the Son of Man. A great deal of the conversation between the Lord Jesus and the Jews of his day concerned his coming in his Father's glory with his angels to redeem and to judge. Let's read some of them. Matthew 26, 64. Let's read. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. He was talking to the Jews, said, you are going to see the Son of Man coming. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27 to 28. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus is saying that some of you here will not die before you see the Son of Man coming. Matthew 23, 37-39. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather you, your children, together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you see, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 24, 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus responded, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its, wicks, its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The Jews knew of only two ages. The Mosaic age and the Messianic age. So the, the Jews, they knew of only two ages. This is the Mosaic age and this is the Messianic age. So the Mosaic age will come to a certain end and then the Messianic age will continue. So when the disciples of Jesus asked him in Matthew chapter 24 verse 3, after he had predicted the destruction of the Jewish temple, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It was the end of the Mosaic age that they were referring to. And when they asked him, after his resurrection in Acts chapter 1 verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It was the Messianic age that they referred to. So they knew the Mosaic age and the Messianic age. So after he resurrected from the dead, they said, are you at this time going to restore your kingdom? That is the Messianic age. Is it going to begin The life of the Jews in the Mosaic age revolved around the temple and the rituals that were performed therein. So in the Mosaic age, the temple and all the laws and the things that revolve around was what pertained in the Mosaic age. And the destruction of the temple automatically meant the end of the Mosaic age and the beginning of the Messianic age. So when the temple is destroyed, it means the Mosaic age has come to an end. 
and the Messianic age is going to begin. While the Mosaic age was the age of the law and centered on the happenings in the temple, the Messianic age was expected to be about the coming of the Jewish Messiah and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom on earth for Israel. So the, it was about the law, the mosaic, mosaic age. And so when the Messiah comes, then the Messianic age is going to begin. And this is what we call the first coming. So the first coming of Jesus was to come and end the Mosaic age so that the Messianic age can start. So then the kingdom, God's kingdom on earth for Israel will start after the temple has been destroyed, the Mosaic the Mosaic age has come to an end and the Messianic age or the kingdom age has begun for Israel on earth. But as Christians, as soon as we hear of the coming of the Son of Man, our minds quickly go to the second coming of Christ to judge the whole world and human history and usher in eternity. So as for us, when we hear of the coming of the Son of Man, we think about the end of the world, the second coming. Uh, but not the first coming. But when Jesus talked about his coming, he referred to the first coming and not to the second coming that we Christians think. Because he was talking to the Jews and telling them that their system will come to an end when the Messiah comes. He will bring it to an end and he will begin the Messianic age. It is at the end of the Messianic age that the world will come to an end and we will be ushered into eternity. But a lot of what Jesus was talking to the Jews about, about his coming, about the end, he was talking about his first coming to end the Mosaic age so that the kingdom age could continue. We never imagine that the full consummation of the first coming of the Son of Man also involved his coming in the clouds to judge the Jews and end the failed Jewish era, the Mosaic era, which had extended for over 1,400 years and usher in the Messianic or the Kingdom Age. After Malachi had told them of the coming of the Messiah, the messenger of the covenant into his temple, he added, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soul. This is Malachi describing the first coming of Jesus. Who can stand when he comes? John the Baptist asked the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Which means by the first coming of Jesus, he was bringing a certain wrath. Who is warning the Pharisees and the Sadducees to run away to escape that wrath that he was bringing? Not, he wasn't referring to the last one. He was referring to the first coming of Jesus. He was bringing wrath on the Jews. John added that the Messiah who will come after him will not only baptize with the Holy Spirit, but also with fire and will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. That is the first coming of Jesus. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John added that the axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. Jesus confirmed it by telling them that if they did not recognize him as their Messiah, their land will be left to them desolate. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 to 38. According to Jesus, the punishment for the rebellion of the previous generations of Jews will be visited on the Jewish generation that was contemporary to his first coming. A good number of the parables of Jesus concern the judgments that were to be poured out on Israel by the Messiah in his first advent. Now the Olivet Discourse. Jesus gave hints 
that his coming was not only for redemption, it was also for judgment. And it was judgment upon the Jews to destroy their temple, to destroy their city, and to end the Mosaic Age so that the kingdom age can, can start and continue. But to his disciples, he told them plainly what was going to happen and gave them timelines when this destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is going to happen, when the Mosaic Age is going to come to an end for the kingdom age to be inaugurated. As for the Jews, he told them in parables. But the disciples, he explained it to them plainly. It is called the Olivet Discourse. The most emphatic statement regarding the Son of Man's coming in the clouds to redeem and to judge the Jews, however, was made in what is termed the Olivet Discourse. That is found in Matthew chapter 24, is found in Mark chapter 13, and is found in Luke chapter 21. They devoted whole chapters to these discussions. Matthew, whole Matthew 24. Mark, whole Matthew 13. Uh, Mark 13. And Luke, whole Ma uh, Luke 21. John didn't write about it. His is the book of Revelations. So the book of Revelations is the same as Matthew 24. Is the same as Mark 13. Is the same as Luke 20, 21. They are all describing the judgment that Jesus' first coming is going to be upon the Jews to end the Jewish uh, era and then allow the kingdom era to continue. On this occasion, Jesus and his disciples had just left the temple complex for the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple. And his disciples had pointed out to him the massive stones that were used to build the magnificent temple. Jesus told them that a time was coming when all the buildings they were seeing and talking about would be destroyed. This is how Mark reports it. As he was leaving the temple, one of the, his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. If you have been to Jerusalem before, you, the, mount, the, the, the temple area mount is also on a mountain. Then there is a valley. Then you go to the Mount of Olives. So they were from the temple. They had just left the temple. Jesus had just left the temple with the disciples. And then they went into the valley and climbed to the Mount of Olives. When you look back, you see the temple on the mountain. And so the disciples said, Jesus, look at the temple. Look at how magnificent it is. Jesus said, look at the buildings. A time is coming that not even one stone will be left on another. The disciples were shocked because this is one of the wonders of the world at the time. When it was built, the king of Sheba traveled all the way from Ethiopia to come and see it. And Jesus is saying that a time is going to come when everything will be destroyed, that even one stone will not be left. The disciples were surprised, so they asked him, Look, last, that it is not only the temple that will be destroyed, but that the people who will be living at the time will all be killed. And the rest who will survive the battle will be, will be taken as captives and scattered all over the world. So this is what Luke says. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke chapter 21 verse 20. 24. The curious apostles of Jesus then wanted to know the timing of the fulfillment of these predictions and the signs that will precede their occurrence. Tell us, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? So when Jesus said the temple will be destroyed, they said, tell us when. And what will be the signs that will indicate to us that they are about to happen? Jesus went on to list for them the signs that will precede this coming judgment. They, were usually, they are usually referred to as the signs of the times. They included the rise of Christ, the rise of false Christ, the rise of false prophets, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, persecution of the disciples, and the spread of the gospel to the then known world before the judgment, however, will be the redemption of those who accepted him 
as a Jewish Messiah. So when they asked when and what will be the sign, then he gave them the signs. At the beginning, there will be false prophets, there will be false Christ. Some will come and say, I am the Christ. Don't let them deceive you. There will be earthquakes, there will be rumors of war, there will be farming, there will be all of these things. Don't let you be deceived. But he gave them a sign. When you see this sign, escape from the city. Otherwise, you'll be destroyed together with those who have rejected me. You have accepted me. You will not be condemned. You will be redeemed. But they will be judged. They will be destroyed. Jesus gave his disciples a sign. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 to 18. So when you, you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. Now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he says, I'm showing you a sign. This is what is going to happen. There is going to be judgment. And it is I who will come and bring that judgment upon Israel to end the Mosaic age so that the kingdom may you continue. But you will not be destroyed together with those who have rejected me. So I'm showing you a sign. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in where he doesn't have to stand, see that the destruction is near. If you are in Judea, run out of the city. If you are on your rooftop, don't come down to pick anything. Jump to the next, jump to the next, jump to the next, and escape to the mountains. And he told them, woe betides you that it doesn't happen in winter. And woe betides you that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath day. Because on the Sabbath day, the zealous will prevent you from running. And in winter, you cannot run. And pregnant women will be in trouble on that day. And, and babies and mothers with babies too will betise them. Pray that it doesn't happen on such days. But it is going to happen. And when you see the sign, escape. But in Matthew, it's so difficult. Abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. We don't understand. Luke's, Luke makes it simple for us. Luke says it in Luke chapter 21, verse 20 to 22. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Luke, Luke makes it simple. Matthew says, when you see the abomination of the desolation standing in the holy place, Luke says, when you see armies surround the city of Jerusalem, know that its desolation is near. If you are in the city, escape. If you are outside, don't enter. If you are on your rooftop, don't come to pick anything. Just jump and go out. And you run away to the mountains. This was not told to the rest of the Jews. They would not even believe. The disciples believed. So when they saw the sign, they escaped. The Bible and history, especially the history as told by Josephus and Tacitus, tell us that all the signs of the times occurred as Jesus had predicted before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, when governors appointed by Emperor Nero were finding it difficult to quell the Jewish rebellion that had begun in AD 66, he recalled to service a retired and very experienced Roman military general known as Vespasian to do it. He led a battalion of about 60,000 elite special forces of the Roman army against Jerusalem. Incidentally, just around that time, in AD 68, Nero killed himself. And Vespasian was recalled to Rome to succeed him as emperor. He then appointed his son Titus, the Titus on the sardines we eat. Also a general with his mercenary troops destroyed Jerusalem, its temple, its inhabitants, and took the remaining prisoners and exiled them into the nations of the world in 70 AD. So the, Titus, this is the ark that was built in memory of Titus in Rome, which is still there. This is the ark of Titus in Rome. After he defeated the Jews and vanquished them and killed everybody and took the rest into prison. By that time, the disciples had escaped the mountains. This is the inside of the ark. 
And you can see it more clearly here. This is the Jews, uh, the Romans, who had planted the temple in Jerusalem. They have carried the utensils. They are taking them to Rome. This is what you find in this ark. This is the inner uh, wall of the ark. And this is what you find. This is, was done in the memory of Titus when he was able to conquer Jerusalem. Went into the temple, destroyed everything, and carried the utensils, and they are taking them to Rome. According to the 4th century church fathers, Eusebius and Epiphanius, the Jerusalem Jewish Christians heeded Jesus' warning in the Olivet Discourse and fled for safety to the mountains of Pella before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Romans. Tradition has it that when the revolt finally broke out, Agrippa II and his sister Bernice were forced to flee to Rome from Jerusalem. Emperor Nero asked Cestius Gallus, governor of Syria, to quell the rebellion of the Jews. He laid siege to Jerusalem, but mysteriously left after six days when he suffered defeat at the hands of the Jews. The Christians, remembering Jesus' instruction, took advantage of the situation and left the city to the mountains. So this is how they were able to escape. When the rebellion started, Nero asked the governor in Syria, to come to Jerusalem and stop them, the zealots, for what they are doing. He came, and the zealots defeated him. So in six days, he ran away. So there was a gap, and the disciples escaped before Vespasian came with his uh, soldiers from Rome, coming in the clouds. The Lord Jesus, in his prediction of judgment upon the Jews in the Oliver Discourse, connected the catastrophe that was to take place in Jerusalem with his coming in the clouds with the angels. He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 to 30, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaking. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will burn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The coming of God in the clouds, accompanied by cosmological changes, was incidentally a typical Old Testament way of depicting God's judgment upon nations and individuals. The ancient Jewish prophets used graphic imagery that is identical to the language used in the Oliver Discourse when they made predictions concerning God's judgment against nations in the Old Testament. These predictions of divine judgments on nations and peoples were fulfilled in the past, but not in the ordinary literal sense. They can only be taken as metaphorical statements regarding God's judgment plan against them. So Jesus is talking about coming in the clouds with the sun darkening and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling. These are all Old Testament uh, language to describe God's judgment coming upon a nation or coming upon a people. You can read that from Isaiah chapter 19, when God's judgment was coming upon Egypt. This is how it is written. An oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rises on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with them. This is judgment coming upon Babylon. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. See, the day of the Lord is coming. A cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not, will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The same applies to when God's judgment was coming upon Edom. All the stars of the heavens will be dissolved and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall. When judgment was coming upon Pharaoh in Egypt, it's the same. When judgment was pronounced against Zion in Joel chapter 2, the same, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. 
the sun will turn to darkness and the moon. These are descriptions of God's judgment coming upon a people or coming upon. So when Jesus is saying that in, in Matthew chapter 24, he is talking about this same judgment that is coming upon the city of Jerusalem to kill the people and to destroy the Old Testament system so that the New Testament system can have the chance. The judgment against those who live in Zion is most likely what Jesus described in his Oliver Discourse. Now, the timing of Jesus' coming in judgment against the Jewish nation. Jesus did indicate that all of the judgments would take place in the generation of his contemporaries before some of his audience passed away. Jesus made it very clear. That is why we are misfiring. He indicated when his coming will be that those who were alive and listening to him, some of them will not be dead at the time he comes. But because we are expecting a literal coming, that is why we think he hasn't come already. What he did, what he, when he said he will come, he has come. And he said, some of you, you will not die before I come. Let's read some of them, maybe. Uh, let's read this one. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and these leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Let's read this one. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus himself is the truth, and he never lies. But when he's speaking, he says, truly, truly, I am telling you. You have to believe what he's saying. He said, truly, truly, I'm telling you, this generation will not pass away before, what, before I come. This generation too has passed away. So has he come or he hasn't come? He has come. The historical evidence points to the generation of Jews in the first century at the generation referred to by Jesus since it is upon that generation that the calamity predicted by Jesus befell. The Jewish temple, Jerusalem, and inhabitants were completely destroyed by the Roman army in AD 70, and the survivors exiled into other lands as Jesus had predicted. Jesus made above, the above predictions in AD 30, and in AD 70, that is a generation, 40 years or a generation from that time, the catastrophe occurred. This is one of the predictions of Jesus that makes him a true and credible prophet and messenger from God. Jesus predicted the time the destruction will occur, and it has occurred. If you go to Jerusalem right now, there is no temple. You ask them, when was it destroyed? In AD 70. By who? By the Roman army. So what Jesus said will happen has happened. So Jesus is a true prophet. A credible prophet of God. Even his critics believe that Jesus said he will come in the lifetime of his disciples. They don't believe him because they say it didn't happen. Because they were expecting a literal coming. But he was talking metaphorically about his coming to destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem. And end the Old Testament system. So that the New Testament system can have the chance to be inaugurated and continued. Now, the expectations of the early church. No. Did some of those who heard him live to see these events as Jesus predicted? Yes. At least. We know that the Apostle John lived to see them. Peter missed the events of Christ's coming in the clouds because he and Paul were killed by Nero before Nero's own death in AD 68. Nero died in AD 68. Before then, he had killed Peter and Paul, so they didn't see it. But as for John, he put him in prison and released him later. So by AD 70, John was alive, so he saw it. Jesus said, some of you standing here will not die before it happens. 
And John was alive when it all happened. That's why he could write the book of Revelation about them. Now, when Jesus indicated to Peter the kind of death he was to experience to glorify God, he asked about that of John. And Jesus asked. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And indeed, the Apostle John was one of those in the audience who did not taste death until they saw the Son of Man coming in the clouds. He died at the old age of about 94 years, around A.D. 100. Peter and Paul died before A.D. 68. Jesus came in A.D. 70. And John died in A.D. 100. So he was one of those who saw what happened in Jerusalem. The coming of Jesus in the clouds to destroy the temple and to kill the people and to scatter those who survived. Now, let's look at, did the early church also expect an, an, a coming of Jesus in their lifetime? Even a cursory look at the writings of the disciples could show that the early church expected a certain coming of the Lord in their lifetime. And they cannot be blamed for having had this expectation. Their Lord gave them reason to have such an expectation. He told them in Matthew chapter 3. Let's, this one is very interesting. Let's read this one. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth. You will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is what Jesus told them. When you go to one city and they reject you, don't waste your time. Go to another because you will not be able to go through all the cities of, of Israel. Israel is itself a small country. But he said you will not finish going through all the cities before I come. So why wouldn't they expect him to come to meet them alive? Peter believed that his days were the last days. He told his, his Jewish audience on the day of Pentecost, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. So Peter is saying his days were the last days. Last days of what? Last days of the end of the world? No, because we are still here. Last days of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the end of the Mosaic age and for the, for the kingdom age to be inaugurated. So when we read last days in the Bible, there's no nothing he's talking about last days. Last days are past. The last days are past. <laughs> he also wrote in his epistle. Let's read. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So the coming of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus was the last times. The following passages from the writings of the Apostle Paul clearly indicate that he also thought he was living in the last days and made his audience and readers expect a certain coming of the Lord in their lifetime. The first one. Romans chapter 11, verse 13, verse 11 to 12. Let's go. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 even those who were married were supposed to treat their wives as if they were not married because their time is short. Which time? He's dead. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they have none because there was a certain distraction coming. If you stay with your wife, it will catch you and kill you and your wife. Behave as if you are not married and pay attention and look for the sign so that when it comes, you can escape to the mountains. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world, in its present form, 
is passing away. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Hebrews 9.26 Then Christ will have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice. So the first coming was the end of a certain age. Now let's read this one. This is a popular scripture. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day was approaching. As you see the day approaching, don't, don't run away from church. Always be coming because otherwise the day will come and you'll be caught off guard and you'll be caught in Jerusalem if you are in there. And then you cannot escape. Hebrews 10, 37. But for in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now, this is what James also said. Be patient, then brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield his valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient. And stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. This is a letter written to people who are living in the, old, in the first century that the judge was standing at the door. How can you read this one to me, living in the 21st century? There is no judge standing at my door. He was standing at their door, not my door. Why did God's judgment come on the Jews of the first century? God entered into a covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel on Mount Horeb. Soon after their rescue from the Egyptian captivity, God promised in the covenant to make them his treasured possession among all peoples, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They would eternally enjoy these blessings only on condition that they fully kept God's commandments and kept the covenant. God gave them the Sabbath as a permanent sign of the covenant and appointed a guardian angel to lead them to their journey to the promised land in the authority of his name, Yahweh. Before their eyes, Moses sacrificed oxen and sprinkled the blood on the altar and on the people to seal the covenant. When the law was read to them, the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Exodus chapter 19 verse 8. However, generation after generation of Jews broke God's covenant and committed halotry by worshipping the lesser gods of the hidden nations around them. Occasionally, God punished them with captivity, which is why they came under Babylonian, Medopatian, Grecian rule in different times in their history until the time of Christ when the Romans were their rulers. God sent many prophets to warn them to repent and return to the Lord, but they never permanently returned to him. The generation of Jews in the days of Jesus was a generation that was to be held responsible for the generation, for the rejection and murder of all the prophets sent to them according to Jesus' parable of the wicked vine dresser. The Jews, the, the tenant farmers, mistreated the prophets, the servants sent to them, and finally even mistreated and killed the Son of God, the only Son and heir, to the, to, to the landowner. And the landowner was left with no other option than utter destruction of the tenant farmers and the handling over of the vineyard to other tenants who would give him fruit. The generation in the days of Jesus that did what no other generation of Jews had done was the generation that was to suffer all the punishment on behalf of all the others. This is the generation that handed over the heir to God's throne and their own Messiah and king to be mistreated 
and brutally executed by Gentiles, Jesus told them in Luke chapter 11, verse 49 to 51, because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles. Some of them they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Even when the Gentile Pontius Pilate sought to let Jesus, Jesus let their, their king Jesus go, they threatened to brand him an enemy of Caesar. The only king they claimed they had, John chapter 19, verse 12 and 15, a brood of vipers indeed. They disowned their own Messiah and preferred a murderer. When Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? Their leaders answered, we have no king but Caesar. John chapter 19, verse 15. When Pilate washed his hands off and did not want to be guilty of innocent blood, the Jews answered, let his blood come upon us and our children. No wonder. But Jesus told the daughters of Jerusalem who were weeping for him when he was going to his crucifixion, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nest. They will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? This is the reason why the generation of Jews, of Jewish people, who were contemporaries of the Lord Jesus during his first coming, were to be punished more severely than any other generation of Jews in their history. And by the destruction of the temple and the holy city and its inhabitants, the Mosaic age in the Jewish polity and old covenant had come to an end, and the Messianic or kingdom age had fully become inaugurated. The Son of Man had gone to the ancient of days to receive dominion and all authority, glory and power in a kingdom that would never be destroyed and had come in the clouds of heaven. So Daniel saw a vision of all that John and Matthew and Jesus is telling the Jews. Let's read it. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was giving authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never pass. Uh, that will never be destroyed. So this is what Daniel saw in his vision. And that is what Jesus did when he came to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. He received a kingdom from the Father, the ancient of days, and then he brought it to wipe out the old one so that the new one can have the chance to, 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 to flourish. The kingdom of God has been taken away from the Jews and given to the church, made up of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Let's read this one. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to those who produce his food, the Jews knew he was talking about them. He would take it away from them and give it to the church. And the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles who have believed in Christ. The old people who are the kingdom are Jews who have rejected Christ, who handed him over for the Romans to destroy him. And so those who produce the fruit, the church, those who have believed in Christ, he took the kingdom away from them and gave it to the church. Conclusion. Mr. Chairman, a decisive event took place in AD 70 in Judea, which significantly changed history, the history of Israel, and is key to understanding many eschatological prophetic passages in the Bible. 
the Roman army, led by General Titus, besieged Jerusalem for four months in a war that had begun in 66 AD. They cut off food supplies to the city and crucified those who attempted to escape. In fact, there was cannibalism in Jerusalem. Women ate their own children because there was no food. At the end of the war in 70 AD, the Jewish holy city of Jerusalem lay in ruins. The temple was burnt and completely destroyed. And the corpses of over one million Jews who had run into the city for refuge lay scattered in the holy city. This was apparently not just a historical event, but a divine design to punish the Jews for their disobedience to God and the breaking of his covenant, and also to end the Jewish polity, the Jewish dispensation, and mosaic economy, which was inaugurated with pomp on Mount Sinai and was to usher in the kingdom of God on earth, had failed after existing for 40, 40 generations due to their moral failings of the people of Israel. It was therefore to come to an end in the most terrific demonstration of God's justice and wrath for the Messiah to establish the true kingdom of God on earth. God's chosen people were dispersed abroad, deprived of their nationality, and excluded from the peculiar relationship with God and made wondrous on the face of the earth and a byword among all nations. The positive side of the catastrophe was that the old order gave way to the new and superior order. The, diviner, the divine government of God by, by the law through Moses gave way for the official inauguration of God's kingdom government by the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. The temple in Jerusalem, which were the outward symbols of the old order, gave way to a new era of God's rule that was not established and confirmed by a city, in, confined to a city and a temple, but in spirit everywhere. Jerusalem and the temple's destruction were the last move that removed any vestige of the old order to demonstrate its complete end to the Jews. The failure of end-time prophecy interpreters to take seriously the time frame references given by Jesus in the Gospels as to this catastrophe is responsible for the confusion that obtains in eschatological discourses. It has also resulted in the countless number of false predictions regarding the timing of the coming of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Even the critics of Jesus affirm the fact that he predicted to return to meet his disciples alive in the first century. Their problem with him is that it was an inaccurate prediction because it was not fulfilled, because they have been looking for a literal fulfillment of the coming of the Son of Man in history. But Jesus was rather speaking about his coming metaphorically when he spoke of the falling of the stars and the darkening of the sun and the moon. However, he linked these metaphors with the prediction of the plunder of Jerusalem, the destruction of the Jewish temple, and the scattering of the first century Jews across the world, all of which were literally fulfilled in history. The metaphor of his coming referred to his signal manifestation in judgment against the Jews, which were fulfilled in history, and his enthronement as king of kings and lord of lords in his kingdom. Emperor Nero, under whose reign and instruction, General Vespasian and, Lat and, 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 and later General Titus fulfilled all that Jesus predicted would happen to the Jews in the generation of his contemporaries, is the beast of revelation and the man of lawlessness in Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. He did the most harm to the church and the apostles in the first century and was the one whose name's number adds up to 666 when written in Hebrew. And when written in Latin, is 616. The mark of the beast is therefore not an electronic device, an electronic device hidden in a vaccine, a computer chip, or a tattoo, by the name of Emperor Nero, of the Roman Emperor from 54 AD to 68 AD, and receiving it on your forehead or arm, is not receiving any tattoo or any chip. It is paying allegiance to the Roman court and emperor worship system and, and being protected by it. This is just as having the name of God 
of his holy city and his new name on the overcomers in the church of Philadelphia and the putting of seals on the foreheads of the 144,000 servants of God. So just as receiving the mark on your forehead or on your arm doesn't mean putting something because God also put a seal on his people. Revelation 3.12, it says, Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. So God also marked his people. Does it mean he's going to put a microchip on your forehead or in your arm? So 666 or mark of the beast doesn't mean you receive a mark or a tattoo. It means you pay allegiance to the Roman system so that they can protect you, which is what happened to the Jews at the time. These Christians didn't. And therefore, they were persecuted and some of them were killed. Paul and Peter were killed by the same system. John was put in prison because he would not submit to it. He would not take the mark. And therefore, he was imprisoned. Paul was killed. Peter was killed. Jesus' prediction of a return was to be expected at the end of the age. But not the end of the world. As the King James Version inaccurately rendered it. The end of the Jewish age took place in 70 AD. But the end of the world of human history is still in the future. Jesus spoke about the end of the age in his Oliver Discourse. But not the end of human history. And it was fulfilled accurately in AD 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Preceded by all the signs of the times predicted. So we should, we should be able to... When Jesus talks about the, 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 the Jewish age and the kingdom age. The Jewish age is when Judaism ruled. The kingdom age is when Christianity reigned and ruled. And the end, the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord and the end of the age, they took place in AD 70 when Jesus came and destroyed the Romans. Jesus through the Romans came and destroyed the Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city and the temple in AD 70. That is when he came. That is when the coming of the Lord and the end of the age. It is not this one. It is not the end of the world that Jesus was referring to. It is not the second coming or eternity that he was referring to. He was referring to this one. And it is part. That is why they never get it right, those who are making predictions. Because he was not referring to this one. He was referring to this one. So when the Bible talks about the last days, he's talking about these days between AD 30 and AD 70. And not the, the period leading to the end of the world or the period leading to the second coming of Christ and eternity. That's not what the Bible, when he's talking about the last days, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about these last days. And so those who are using what Jesus said about this one to predict this one, they will never get it right. Because it is in, behind us. They are also looking for it in the future. This other little boy looking for his coin in the wrong place. They will never find it. Jesus brought the kingdom of God to the earth to oppose and defeat the kingdom of the devil. The kingdom of the devil had been in control of the world since the devil was cast down by the holy angels after his rebellion in heaven. Israel failed to be God's means of consummating his kingdom. So Jesus came and destroyed them for the kingdom to extend over the nations. Jesus predicted a final return to consummate the kingdom of God for the righteous who must watch and wait for it. The Lord Jesus will come again to end human history, but nobody knows when. We should not worry about that. Just live right and die right. Ever since they said he will come, 
Our forefathers have died and gone. He hasn't come. Because he was, they were, he was talking about here, he has come already. Here, we don't know. Don't worry about yourself. Live right, die right. You are okay. So the Lord Jesus will come again to end human history. Nobody knows when. Renovate the heaven and the earth into a new heaven and a new earth and consummated kingdom of God. A union of the new heaven and the new earth for his father, for himself, and for the righteous. No one knows when that will happen. Thank you.